topic we're going to be reading from, Matthew chapter 21. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, it will also come up on the screen. Um, But yeah. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Thanks, Esme. Hello, everybody. Uh, lovely to see you all. And um, two dramatic stories there. I wonder what comes to mind as you uh, uh, picture those, uh, picturing the scene. I wonder what modern equivalents um, conjures up in your mind. Perhaps it's some kind of sporting team open top bus tour. Perhaps it's uh, Forest bringing home the playoff trophy 2022 in a couple of months here in Nottingham, Uh, maybe more like a royal tour, uh, something like that. Anyone ever met the Queen here, just out of interest, scanning the room? Was that with, I saw saw a movement of hands, but no, not quite. Uh, We're content with meeting uh, Queen Elizabeth Benton, who's one of our uh, dear older people amongst this. Um, If you're watching, hello. Um, I think what it most reminds me of, do you go go with me on this for a second, is the entrance of a bride at a wedding. Because when a bride enters into a a wedding, what she enters into is uh, an event that she has most likely organized with everything um, exactly as she has arranged, uh, particularly if she's one of those bridezilla brides. You know, we've all heard stories, haven't we? Um, But but what we have here in these two events, actually three events, we didn't read the cursing of the fig tree that happens after the cleansing of the temple, but we'll refer to that later, is we have some very carefully choreographed movements and arrangements of Jesus that are designed to achieve some very, very specific things. And I'm not just meaning the, the go get the donkeys of, uh, of verse two, but, but check these things out that, that Jesus is deliberately um, doing. I'm a bit echoey here, Jesus. Am I doing anything wrong? I, cool. Maybe it's just my voice. Um, but, but check these things out. Jesus is deliberately doing. He's, um, he's coming in from the east. The geography of verse 1 uh, indicates that. He's coming to redeem his people. And that actually is, is the whole Bible story that from the moment of Adam and Eve first disobeying God, they were put out to the east of the Garden of Eden. And all along the storyline, significant kind of redemption moments always come uh, from the east. So uh, when Moses comes to, um, redeem, uh, comes to uh, bring his people Um, out of slavery uh, in the Exodus. He's been in the land of Midian. That's to the east of Egypt. He comes uh, from the east. When the people enter the promised lands, they enter from the east. 
Uh, The temple that was built, the dwelling place of God, it faced to the east, ready to welcome uh, the presence of God. The return from exile of the people of God that came from the east. Again, this kind of uh, salvific uh, moment. The wise men who came to see Jesus, uh, symbolizing the Gentiles, those that uh, weren't Jewish, weren't part of the people of God at the time. They came from the east. Whenever you see east in the scripture, there's often some kind of reference to God coming to save his people. (laughs) But also, Jesus is very deliberately coming to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, of course, is is where the temple was, the kind of central point of um, of Israelite life. And um, his stop at the temple actually was the first stop on the the royal tour, if you use that analogy. It talks about that in, in verse 12, as we heard. And that is because one of the great promises of the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 3, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, is that the Lord, who by now had left his temple, would suddenly return again to dwell and refine and purify his people as he did so. (laughs) Jesus is deliberately achieving that. But then lastly, he he comes to complete Israel's story. And um, you might have noticed there's lots of um, Old Testament quotations um, or or bits that kind of hint at other bits in the story. The the donkey entry was prophesied of uh, the coming messianic king in uh, Zechariah chapter 9. The cloaks on the road would remind the Israelites people of King Jehu from 2 Kings chapter, uh, chapter 9, who received the same treatment when he was anointed king. And so the Jews of the time, the whole thing would have reminded them of a key event in their history, the rededication of the temple. It happened in 164 BC. It's between the Old and the New Testaments. And what happened there was the temple got cleansed, palm branches got waved, shouts of Hosanna filled the air, and the people looked forward to a coming redemption, which obviously had not yet happened by this point. The scene on that day just like a bride entering the wedding, is that something big is about to happen. And the reason is that Jesus Christ, just like the bride at the wedding, is in control of every single detail. And it's worth just pausing, even at this early moment, just to reflect on that, that Jesus is in control of every single detail of your life. He knows the pain that you are going through right now. He knows the trials. He knows the challenges. He knows the things that you wish were different. And he has a plan. He has a way forward. And he calls you. He beckons you. In fact, he even pursues you to follow him. Now, how many here know that names and descriptions are very, very important on a bride's wedding day? Uh, my wife Emma uh, giggled through our ceremony because the person uh, uh, doing, uh, sorry, giggled through the uh, rehearsal for our ceremony uh, because the person doing the officiating couldn't pronounce her surname properly and kept getting it wrong. Um, We've all heard stories, haven't we, about um, kind of the awkward stories where like previous boyfriends' names get mentioned when he meant to say the groom or whatever. Um, <clears throat> in fact, one of Emma's friends had a, um, a, fa- a father of the bride speech at her wedding. Um, this guy whipped out this list of um, comparing guy A to guy B that he had been through with his daughter who was getting married. And I think his point was that um, the, the, the list went well because Guy A was here as the groom. And what he didn't realize was that Guy B was also here <laughs> in the congregation. And um, the list was, um, shall we say, a pretty honest assessment, you know, particularly arrogant. Or, um, what also happened was that it became increasingly clear um, as the list went on uh, who Guy B actually was. <laughs> And so, well, there we go. We, everybody but the bride loves stories like that, right? You know? <laughs> um, names and descriptions matter. And in the same way, just have a look at the names and descriptions that are given of Jesus in this passage. In verse 3, it talks about the Lord, the Lord. And that can just mean um, master. Uh, but at the very least, it it confers authority. And as we increasingly come to understand the story, what we realize is that that term is actually loaded with more than just its everyday meaning. This is the Lord. This is Yahweh. This is the Lord of heaven and earth. This is the ultimate master. 
Then we get Messiah and King in uh, verses four and five. King is there overtly in verse five. But I put the two together because uh, in Zechariah chapter nine, as we mentioned a moment ago, the promise was that a messianic king would come and he would save God's people and he would bring them victory. But actually, that, the promise was that that victory would be established through humility and through peace and not in, in warfare as the, um, against the Romans as, as the people at the time expected. And so in the story, in Jesus comes riding on a donkey, the suffering servants, as the, the chapter before has just told us. And, and it, it calls this donkey the beast of burden in, in verse 5. And this donkey, yes, it was sort of everyday animal. But actually, donkeys in the time were, were also used by kings. They were, they were still royal animals. And kings rode on them when they wanted to demonstrate the establishment of peace. So if you were a ruler, if you wanted to declare war, you came on a horse. If you wanted to show peace, you came on a donkey. That's what Jesus is doing here. Then you get son of David in in verse 9. And uh, David, of course, was king at the high point of Israel's history. Uh, He was a man who, in spite of his flaws, was said to be after God's own heart. And so one to whom God had promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that a descendant of his would build a kingdom and a house temple for God that would be everlasting. He was the promised one. That's who Jesus is here. And then lastly, in verse 9, you get the crowd saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a quote from uh, Psalm 118 uh, from a collection of Psalms. It's the last one um, uh, in what's called the Egyptian Halal. Halal uh, Halal just means praise. Um, uh, which was a collection of psalms that would have been sung at at key festivals in the Jewish calendar. And they celebrated God's deliverance in the Exodus. They celebrated that he was the deliverer. Clearly, names matter. And what the crowd saw was someone who was worth taking their cloaks, symbolizing their whole lives, and pulling down palm branches symbolizing the resources all around them, and laying them before Jesus. It begs the question of us, what are we laying before Jesus today? The Lord, the Messiah, the King, the Promised One, the Deliverer. You see, the revelation here is that Jesus is worthy of everything that in the house of our lives, there is no room that we should keep locked away from him. (laughs) That there's no space for just singing the songs on a Sunday, but then worshiping the world by the Wednesday. This is the yeah, but attitude, the secret habits, the procrastinated action. No, he's worthy of giving our whole lives to. And when we talk about giving of our lives and our resources, often we talk about time and money, but what about our sexual desires? Are they submitted before Jesus? What about our mental health? What about our kids' futures, our own lifespan, or our reputation? Are those things truly submitted? before the Lord, the King, the Messiah, the Deliverer, the Promised One? What about our self-image, our definition of success, the events of our past? Have we laid them before Jesus? And that is to say, even even if it leaves us feeling a little bit vulnerable, these guys in verse eight here who took their cloaks and, and laid them before Jesus, this wasn't just some kind of outer coat under which they had a kind of full outfit on. As they took their garments off, some of these guys would have felt pretty exposed. They would not have been left wearing an awful lot. And yet they knew he was worthy. They knew he was trustworthy. Even though their view of Jesus was a bit skewed at this point, even though they thought he was this political Messiah come to kick the Romans out, even though they were surprised by his humble beginnings from Nazareth, as verse 11 talks about, Jesus proved himself trustworthy. Because in spite of their fickleness, and we know, of course, the change of heart of the crowds who days later were baying for him to be crucified, nonetheless, he went to the cross and he defeated sin and death for them and for us. 
and he delivered and freed them in a much deeper way than they could ever have imagined. Folks, our vulnerability is met in his victory. Our exposure is covered by his death. And to all who would hide things in life away from Jesus because it's painful to address, it's difficult to think about, I want to say today, it is worth unlocking the door and to let the King of glory come in. To all of us, it's, it's, this, this passage begs the question, is this our lived cry of praise? Is this our action to lay down our whole lives for the one who laid his down for us? It is so easy, isn't it, as life gets busier, as we get older and go through life stages and years and, and what have you, to appear sorted but simply just be asleep on the inside. As a church family, I want to plead with you as we plead with one another. Give your life wholly and fully and utterly to Jesus in every single area. He's worthy of it all. I know this will look different practically for different ones of us. To follow Jesus wholeheartedly looks very different for, um, I don't know, the surgeon working in the hospital to the new mom with a newborn to uh, someone that has more time in their way. It looks very, very different for us. But we have a God who looks on the heart, who wants our hearts wholly and fully submitted to him. And where our, our hobbies will try and lay claim to our, uh, to our intrigue, where sometimes family life can lay claim to our time, where sometimes careers can lay claim to our focus, or disappointments lay claim to our goodwill, or kind of pleasures around us like trying to lay claim to our fulfillment, only Jesus can satisfy. I want to ask us this morning, are we sold out for him? Because the heart is that in that place. Then by contrast leads us on to the cleansing of the temple as it gets called, where the imagery is uh, somewhat different than a graceful bride enjoying her wedding. And um, here's where it happened. There's a picture on the screen. Uh, sorry to you guys over here if you missed it at the start. This screen's had a paddy, but that's okay. We all have one of those from time to time, don't we? So um, here, here it is. I don't know if I need to duck. Probably not. I'm not that tall. Um, but um, a, a picture of kind of what the um, temple complex would have looked like in the time of Jesus. Uh, most likely where Jesus uh, turned over the tables of the money changes, as, as we read earlier, is the sort of ra slightly raised part to it in the southwest corner. Um, the, the bit kind of in the middle is the, the actual temple itself, this kind of T-shape, and um, that's, that's where it took place. And if you're anything like me, you read these, these events about Jesus kind of driving out the money changes, and it can make you feel a little bit uncomfortable because we know that Jesus never sinned. We know that the fact that he never sinned is pretty important to, uh, to him taking our sin. And so we kind of say, well, like, what, what's going on here? And the starting point, the starting place, is that this is a Jesus who utterly hates injustice and mistreatment. It is noticeable that it is the exploitative temple traders and those who are selling pigeons, some translation doves, but the sacrificial offering of the poorest that he goes after, that he targets. Quite simply, we have a Jesus who will not stand for abuse, who will not stand for oppression. And whether that is uh, paying people a proper wage, whether that is overt or covert racism, whether that is violence or slurs against women all too common in our society, whether that is the trampling of the poor, whether that is wars of greed, this is what Jesus thinks of it. His kingdom kicks it out. He will not stand for it, and neither should we. And, and then Jesus um, quotes from Isaiah 56. He says, my house should be called a house of prayer. And this house of prayer for all nations, as Isaiah states and Matthew implies here, he's saying this house of prayer for all nations has become something totally different under you guys. And you can see it if you look at the picture again. Like, Just look how many uh, doors and barriers and gates there are to kind of getting it. There's, I, I count it, there's seven different entrances you would have to go through uh, to get from the outside into the most holy place, which people at time wouldn't have been allowed to do, but uh, by his grace is what the Lord Jesus does for us to bring us right into um, the presence of the Father. What 
what was meant to be a welcome for the whole world, the leaders of the time, had, the people of the time, had become hell-bent on keeping them out. And once again, Jesus will not have it. And it's really interesting to note, um, Pete Corpasse just said to me into the week, in the week, we were just looking at this picture together, Jesus said, I am the gate, the door. You don't need the seven entrances that go through. I am the door. We just trust in him. And he's got it all. And he, what, so what Jesus then does is he takes it up a level. Because this passage isn't primarily about exploitation or about exclusion, though it is there. It's more, it's actually about what it is that these things show, which is a whole attitude of hypocrisy that the Israelite people had, a a religiosity, a pretense. It's true in Jesus' day. Sadly, it had been true for generations before, and sadly, sometimes true in generations after too. It's the attitude where people would say, yes, Lord, with their mouths, but not with their hearts. And actually, this temple cleansing is followed, as we mentioned, by the cursing of the fig tree, where um, we know it's related. Mark kind of sandwiches the the temple cleansing around the um, the fig tree cursing, where Jesus sees this fig tree, and it's got leaves on it, which is an indication that there's fruit there. And he looks, and there's no fruit. So Jesus curses it, and uh, and the fig tree dies. What he's saying is that Israel had kind of stationed themselves as being a well-flowering tree that's promised fruit, but delivered none. And he said, you guys, you've made this a den of robbers. Which, yes, exploitation, yes, robbing from God. But the phrase actually comes from Jeremiah chapter 7, which actually prophesies the downfall of the temple because of the unfaithfulness, because of the unfruitfulness of God's people. So what he's saying is this Isaiah 56 promise of a house of prayer for all nations, of a place of safety, of a place of encounter for the world, it's been totally abused. And so he does a prophetic act. And Jesus ceases the temple's activity as a sign of what one day will come. He stops the traders from trading. He stops the money changers from exchanging. He stops the sellers from selling, and he kicks them all out. And for a short but momentous period, what Jesus is saying is that the way things are, your pretense, your hypocrisy, your religiosity, it will be no more. This whole temple system is coming down. And you can imagine the scene, if we can just get the picture up there again, Deji, thank you. This place, rammed full of people. Jerusalem at the time, population about 50,000. They reckon that during Passover, uh, which was uh, about to come, there would have been a further 150,000 people descending on the city. Most of them went towards this place. Jesus picks the biggest moment to say, enough is enough. And that's where the term cleansing, I actually don't think is a very helpful description. Cleansing implies, look, come on, give it here. I'll kind of sort it out, give it back to you guys, have another go. Now, this, this is more a declaration of judgment prophesying its end. Guys, Jesus ain't hitting refresh here. He's hitting cancel. And and it happened, 70 AD, the Romans come and um, absolutely decimated the temple. And yet, as we mentioned earlier, did not Malachi chapter three prophesy that the Lord would come suddenly to his temple once again, that he would take decisive action and he would stop his people robbing from God. I don't know about you, but as I go through these things, I can't ignore the challenge to my own heart that Jesus really cares about fruit, that true faith produces true fruit. That's, that's all over the New Testament. But there's tremendous importance in asking ourselves, where is the fruit of following Jesus? And I was you know, messing around earlier with singing songs on Sunday to... Uh, worshipping the world on Wednesday, but it's massive. It's absolutely massive. The passage lands here once again. Because in a society that competes for our attention, that is by and large anti-God, it could be hard being a Christian, couldn't it? Things can happen that we don't understand. And if our faith in Jesus is not real and, and alive within us, then we can know the right things to say, but hey, we can't make the fruit happen. We're about to enter into a week where we can really ground this question in Easter. 
Easter, the high point of the Christian calendar. We have so much to celebrate. The king of heaven came to die for us in our place, for our sin, and then raised to life to show he's ruling and reigning in glory. And so this question really can provoke in us. Are we going to celebrate these things in religiosity? You know, it's Easter. We just do these things, maybe even in reluctance. Or is this week going to be a week of worship? and wonder, gazing upon the truth of the gospel by which we are changed and saved and set forevermore. But if those things and those heart attitudes are terrifyingly recognizable, we need only remember that in the gospel, every challenge is always met with the comfort and the sufficiency of Jesus. Because what's going on here, it's not just out with the old. What Jesus now does is to do another prophetic act, actually, and he he foretells the church that he will form through his impending death and resurrection, which is actually why he's arrived in Jerusalem in the first place. And in verse 14, having kicked the money changes, etc., out, he gathers the blinds and the lame who'd been excluded as far back as King David to Samuel chapter 5, and he heals them. And then he lets unassuming and vulnerable children make it a place of praise as they repeat the cries of the crowd that they've heard, Hosanna to the son of David. And then he defends them against the attacks of the hypocritical leaders who think they know better. He creates a place of safety and healing, of praise and protection, of diversity and Jesus-centeredness. This is the church. The Lord has come to his temple once again, created a new people, a house of prayer for all nations where everyone is welcome. And Jesus' word to us today would be that this is who we are now, that we are a people of promised fruitfulness, that this is what he came to do, to triumphantly arrive in the lives of his people as Lord, as Messiah, as King, as promised one, as deliverer, to rid us of our dead works religion and to create a new temple, united and empowered by him, the church. And if you put your life wholly in Jesus' hands, you need never worry that fruit will not come such is his promise. There will come a day, won't there, just to finish off, where Jesus will come once again to his people, where the animal will this time be a war horse, where every knee will welcome him as the crowds did, where he will finally purge all sin and religiosity and hypocrisy from the world, and where once again he'll make all things new the new temple, as heaven and earth join together, where all who acknowledge him are safely welcome. But in the meantime, we live with the deposit of the Holy Spirit, who reminds us of the sufficiency of Jesus' sacrifice, who causes us to re-examine our hearts to see if they line up with his will and to receive the comfort and the power of his forgiveness. And there is no better place to do that than in taking communion together, which we're about to do, where the word of God instructs us to examine ourselves before the Lord. And so here's what we're, what we're going to do to facilitate. We're going to invite the bands uh, back up. You guys serve us so well. Thank you. And um, just for the, the rest of the meeting, we'd, this is just going to be a, a place, an atmosphere of worship. We're just going to spend some time worshiping Jesus together. And um, the communion is, is ready and waiting, but we're going to do what as the word of God says. We're going to examine our hearts. We're going to examine ourselves. Are our lives fully given over to Jesus in every area? Are there rooms in our hearts that we have locked away from Jesus because they're difficult or they're painful to address? Is there any religiosity in our hearts where we're saying, yeah, we're the the fruitful tree, and yet actually inside we're asleep. We're just doing things out of routine. 
And as the Lord highlights those things, I want to encourage you to repent of those things, to turn away from those things back to God, to say, Jesus, I need your grace. I'm done with that, that, that stuff, living in that way. I don't want religiosity to characterize me. I don't want to lock rooms away from you anymore. I'm looking to you now. And when you've done that, I just encourage you to go to one of the tables. There's three here, one, two, three at the back. And just to take the bread symbolizes the body of Jesus, the wine symbolizes the blood of Jesus, to go back to your seat and to take it and to know that Jesus' sacrifice makes you new, that you now belong to him, holy. But he promises a life of fruitfulness for you. If you wouldn't call yourself a Christian in this place today, you don't have to go and do this. You can just enjoy the atmosphere of worship. People will go at different times as they feel ready. But hey, there's an invitation to, there's an invitation to the table of Jesus. If you wanna to say today, I choose to follow you, Jesus. And you come, take the bread, take the wine as your act of faith. Jesus, today my life is yours. So the band are gonna leave us in some songs. It'd just be kind of a quiet space to begin with, just as we examine our hearts, just see if there's anything the Lord would have us turn away from, turn to him. And then as you're ready, just stand up, just go to one of the tables, take the bread, take the wine, come back, take it. Remember who you are as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven.